Well, I talked to Marvin last week, and he said you folks had a discussion on that uh, terrible incident down in uh, Connecticut where all those innocent children and teachers were slaughtered by a madman. I want to talk a little bit about it today myself because I know I'm like all of the rest of you. When that story started unfolding, you started seeing the, the, the scenes of, of, of havoc and, and the scenes of grief and uh, of fear in the, in the faces of those people who were wondering, is my child spared or is he dead or she? And there was one really poignant picture that I, that I noticed was a, a lady that was uh, on a cell phone and she was, as they say, her heart out and, and that that picture alone just struck me um, and you can't keep from getting emotional about such a horrific uh, situation that they had there it's just terrible and the problem is it's happening all too often now in the scheme of evils that have been taking place in this earth since man was placed here that would be uh, that one would probably be not on the radar but what has brought it to us in, in full force is the fact that we have communication now that we didn't have years and years ago. You basically knew about yourself and, and the neighbors around you because you didn't have a newspaper. You didn't have CNN or Fox or MSNBC. It was word of mouth. And there were terrible things taking place that people never knew about. But now every evil thing that takes place, we know about it. We see it on, and we hear it. And it... It actually will mess with our psyche. It can't keep from it. So we're left with all these, all these scenes and thoughts of evil. You know, you look over at the um, uh, African nation and you see the, the, the tribal wars there. You see the atrocities. You see the famine. You see the babies with the large emaciated stomachs. And they're looking for something to eat. They're laying there and the flies are, you know, in their eyes. And we complain about our lives. You know, when we compare ourselves to other people, we are extremely blessed. God has been great to us. He's been good. And a lot of people will see these things and they'll say, well, where was God? Well, He wasn't there. And He wasn't there because we didn't want Him there. When I say we, uh, as a people, did not want God in our lives, telling us what and what not to do. It's just that simple. Early on, in the Old Testament, you find that man was rebelling against God and they wanted a king. He said, okay, I'll give you a king. So we got what we asked for. We don't discipline our children as <laughs> I think as God would want us to. Uh, and I'm not sp speaking about this group, but I'm talking about this, this country. You'll find the children in the stores and they'll be throwing a, <laughs> as some, some person said once, a hissy fit, whatever that is. <laughs> All I know is I get so embarrassed for the parents because they have no control over the child. The child is just waiting for the moment to see something and throw a fit if he doesn't get it. Or she doesn't get it. They're just, they're just waiting. They know that, and our, our government's probably made parents that way because you, you don't necessarily want to get uh, caught or seen uh, actually using some corporal punishment on a child that's misbehaving in a public place. There are places in this country where you would be up the creek without the paddle. You would be the one breaking the law. And it, just for disciplining your children. So I, I see some of the apprehension about the parents who don't want to do anything. And they'll be saying, well, shut up. Or, you know, they'll try to, but they won't. They, the more they say, do, uh, shut up, the, <laughs> the angrier they get. I know I've told the story before, but, you know, uh, in retrospect, it was, uh, it was funny, but it's indicative of the things that children will do. Uh, a lady that I know very well, she was with her child in the grocery store. 
And uh, he wanted a certain kind of cereal, and I, I guess he probably pulled it off the rack. Well, she didn't want to buy that cereal. She either wanted something else or she didn't want to buy cereal a, a, at all. He looked at her and pointed his finger and he says, I'm going to whip your... <laughs> Enough said. <laughs> That's a true story. Our society continues to grow rebellious, undisciplined, untempered. I believe it's in the book of Timothy where it talks about we need to have self-control, you know, temperance, self-control. But people don't control themselves any longer like they used to. If they get angry with you, <clears throat> you can hear every expletive that has ever been said. And it's not limited to males anymore. Um, i tell you a thing, I'll tell you for sure, I'd rather come have the wrath of a man come down on me than a woman. Hades has no fury like a woman upset or scorned. Okay? But it just indicates where our society is opposed to where it should be. And as again, I say we've got what we wanted. I want you to look in the book of Romans, the first chapter, to begin this. <clears throat> I don't really have a title for this message. Um, I don't know, I might, I might title it Unbridled Anger. That might be a good title for it. I, I just didn't do it this morning. But we find over here, <coughs> excuse me, in the book of Romans, Paul speaking to the church. <coughs> you get that? Paul speaking to the church. Because we see all these atrocities being done, and we don't think about the church ever being able to, to do something like that. Now, I don't know, you probably don't know it, but I locked that back door today. It hasn't been too many years ago that in a church of God in, I think it's Wisconsin or Minnesota somewhere, it was not a Church of God international group, but it was a, one of the other uh, Church of God groups, where a man was upset about a sermon, he came back and, you remember that, don't you? How many remember that? Robert Beg your pardon? Robert Roger, uh, Robert Meredith at the church. Is it Robert? Roderick, yeah, Roderick Meredith. It's in his church. I mean, there he went and there started shooting and, and people died. We've seen many churches that have had people enter in with the purpose of killing all they could. Now, we're not talking about a fit of passion. Uh, we're not talking about jealousy, uh, about a rage of that sort of thing. We're talking about something else. So let's, let's examine this a little bit. Let's look in the book of Romans, the first chapter. And I'd like to read verse 28 um, and 29. Here, Paul is speaking to these folks, and he says, And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge. You caught that, didn't you? They did not like. You could just say they did not like God. Because they would not be under his authority. There's never been a man alive, including Jesus Christ, that has not been under authority. He was under authority to his father. Now, I'm not saying all authority is good because it's not. A lot of it's corrupt. And if you don't believe it, just watch the evening news every day and see what's happening in different countries and nations. It's just so evil. You know, you just, your mind just can't and shouldn't be delving into all this bad stuff all the time because it can have a, it can have a, a, a bad effect on your, your outlook, your mind. You could even become depressed and, and despondent yourself and, and pull back from, from any kind of uh, social life. But it says, they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, and God gave them over to a reprobate mind. What does that mean? He gave them over. Why didn't he strike them? Why didn't he strike them blind? Or why didn't he uh, make their arms unable to be uh, 
useful or their legs? Why didn't he make them paraplegics? Because God doesn't work that way. He wants somebody to come to him willing to allow him to teach them how they should behave in their, in their home life, in their work, and uh, in public. So he gave them over to a mind void of judgment. That is good judgment and proper judgment. To do those things which are not convenient, being filled with all unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, debate, all sorts of these things that he's talking about that people in these latter days are involved in. But he's also talking to the church folks who are doing the same thing. We're talking about a Roman church here that was filled with pagan gods, theologies and ideas, concepts and paradigms. They were full of this this, uh, idol worship. And these people had come out of that, but they had not forgotten all of it. And anything goes in a Roman church. It's a church of what's happening now. Church of what you want to do now. They were actually exchanging gifts at this time of the year themselves, observing the Saturnalia, a winter solstice festival. That's where the date came for Christmas. It was picked from a winter solstice pagan observance. And they want to attach Christ to that. Well, excuse me, but I worship Christ not with the holidays, but with his holy days, which he has named in both the New and uh, Old and New Testament. But they're given over all these things, backbiters, haters of God, despiteful, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, and disobedient to parents. I mean, every atrocity that you could name under the sun is being mentioned here, and it goes to uh, verse 29. Uh, well, I've already read that, verse 29, uh, where they said murder. Now, <clears throat> let's look at verse 5 of the next chapter. But after your hardness and impenitent, impenitent heart, treasure up to yourself wrath against the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God. You call it that hardness and impenitent, unable to repent. Unable to feel remorse. Unable to show any shame. Like that young man entering into that school and slaughtering those little children and the adults. He had no qualms about it. Psychopath is what he was. One of the things that they never mention on television is that we are in a world that is filled with Satan the devil. In the book of Corinthians, it says the God of this world, Satan the devil, is at work alive and well. Many people have killed over uh, anger, passion, um, to uh, obtain something that wasn't theirs. Rob banks. Shoot you and take your car. I mean, just anything and everything is happening today. Many people have done that out of selfishness, out of uh, envy for something somebody else has, they've earned, they've worked for. Crimes of passion happen all the time. Women are, are, uh, uh, and men are having intimate relationships with those other than their their spouse. They get caught and... and, uh, This jealousy, this rage just overtakes a person. I'm not talking about that kind of rage. I'm not talking about that sort of uh, thing happening to people because that's just a a fit of rage and anger in the moment. That's that's just in the moment situation where all of a sudden you're in this situation and it makes you angry. And like that, you either walk away from it or you choose the wrong choice. But I'm talking about the cold, calculated evil that is getting in some people's minds today that comes from something that we don't want. 
You never hear about it on the news. You never hear that there's an influence out there that can actually come into a person and make them, not make them, they allow it, their mind is open to it, and so he makes a way for them to be able to do that. My question is, where did, they, where did this man get these guns? I bought a handgun yesterday. And I'm going to take it with me everywhere I go when I'm traveling. Because I know that evil lurks everywhere. I trust God to take care of me. But I'm not tempting him. So therefore, it's like David who had three rocks. You got something to say? He was a young man that loved you, but just before this ever happened, right. he told me one day, he said, I'm taking medicine and you're not uncomfortable. He said, I have these thoughts wanting to go to the school house and kill the children. Mm -hmm. Drugs. This, this before this ever even happened. Yeah. And I said, well, you keep taking that stuff. Well, what are you doing? Mm. Drugs. You know, uh, <clears throat> I've been, uh, I've been associated with some mental illness in my family. <clears throat> and uh, when we sought help for them, the mental health uh, people, the first thing they ask is, well, is this person doing drugs? Because, you know, under the influence of alcohol or drugs, people are less likely to be self-controlled. They're, they're much like, more likely to let their anger reach too far and do these evil things. First thing they ask about this person. And the reason they ask about the drugs is because they told us that if it's drug related or induced or whatever you call it, that once they stop taking the drugs, these thoughts leave. This mental illness that they have is temporary. And once they stop the drugs, they're no longer mentally ill. <clears throat> so it goes along with everything that we're, uh, we're talking about today. <clears throat> Let's go to Matthew, the fifth chapter. No, I didn't write it down my time. <clears throat> Matthew, the fifth chapter. <clears throat> Again, I basically want to uh, <clears throat> speak about the anger that's unbridled, calculated. Because, you know, this guy, he didn't just uh, all of a sudden say, well, I'm going to get some guns and I'm going to go down and shoot children. He thought about it. He planned it. And he had a thought in his mind what it would look like, what it would create, what kind of suffering and terror. And it did not bother him. It did not faze him. It was not something that... Uh, his conscience was going to be fretful about. Didn't bother him at all. Pure psychopath that has another spirit working in him. Matthew 5, verse 22. <clears throat> he says, But I say unto you that whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment and whosoever shall say to his brother, Raka, shall be in danger of the council, but whoever shall say to his brother, you fool, shall be in danger of hellfire. But you know, brethren get angry at each other. And there's a place where it tells us in the New Testament, be angry but sin not. But it's a righteous anger. It's an anger that Christ felt when he got upset with the scribes and Pharisees and their hypocrisy. And they're trying to keep the people under control. Oh, you can only walk so many steps. They got angry with him when he healed people. Duh. What kind of a mind is that? They got jealous of him because the people saw his miracles and they were following him and they wanted to hear what he said. And they were angry. Because, you don't you know, they were the, the elite of the church. Or at least they thought. So here we're told that we, we shouldn't have uh, anger at all. And this, this will be more in the type of uh, uh, anger that would just swell up real quick. And could even leave as quick. 
But again, we're not talking about that today. But let's go to Mark, uh, the, the third chapter. Mark 3. Mark, the third chapter, and uh, beginning in verse 1. This is where Christ entered into the synagogue, and there was a man there with a withered hand, and they watched him. They wanted him to heal somebody, not because the person needed it, but so they could point fingers at him and say, this man does wrong. He heals of all things, despicably heals a man on the Sabbath day. Well, the Sabbath was made for us, not us for the Sabbath. We're not captive to the Sabbath. We honor God by keeping the Sabbath, and that's what we come for, to bring praise and honor unto His name. It's not for our glory. Because everything we know, He's given to us. He's opened our minds to receive the truth. We've we've not done anything, but we've read His Word. People read it every day. And you'll be surprised at how many people in prison say they're Christian. But you let them out. They get real religious in prison. And I'm not saying there's not some Christians in prison, because I don't know. But they will use religion to their advantage. Just like these people that have these uh, fish signals, uh, signals, fish signs on their stationery. Names like Honest Charlie, and there's a fish up there. If his name's Honest Charlie, you better go somewhere else. (laughs) Because if he has to announce it, if he has to convince you, then you're probably at the wrong place. You probably need to move on. But they were getting angry and they, and they, <clears throat> that they might accuse him. Verse 2. In verse 3 he says unto the man uh, that had to wither the hand, Stand forth, you know, come forward. In verse 4 he said unto him, Is it lawful to do good on the Sabbath day or to do evil? To save life or to kill? And guess what? His adversaries were closed mouth. They could not answer. They held their peace as it says. And when he had looked around on, uh, and when he, that is Christ, had looked around on them with anger. There is proper anger. We're also told that this anger should not, what? Last beyond sunset. Don't let the sun go down on your anger. But there is a proper anger, and he was very angry with these hypocrites, and he looked round about on them with anger, being grieved for the hardness of their hearts. I can tell you that that man that killed all those children, his heart was stone. He had no heart. He had already let an evil come into him and allow him to do the things that he had in mind to do. But it was calculated. He planned it. It wasn't just some random shooting like you might have uh, in uh, the city streets where drugs, drug ga- gangs are fighting against each other. It wasn't, it wasn't anything spontaneous like that. It was something calculated, cold and ruthless. So anyway, Christ here heals this man and these people are looking at him like, uh, well, let's look, read verse 6. And the Pharisees went forth and straightway took counsel with the Herodians against him how they might destroy Destroy the Savior. Now that's a jealousy that, that, that boils up and, uh, and it makes you angry because he's got something or getting something that you want. They want to control. They'd had it all, these, all their lives, basically, and they didn't want to give it up. And people looked upon them like, look at that whited sepulcher. Well... You know, they look good on the outside. We all can clean up pretty good if we want to. But God is not interested on the outside. He's interested on what's inside the heart. And he wants us to be circumcised in our hearts and not our flesh. That means our mind. 
our mind. Now, let's go to Matthew uh, 1, verse 16. <clears throat> An illustration of anger caused by <clears throat> a jealousy. Matthew 1. I think I picked the right scripture. <clears throat> yep, better turn my page here. Oh, let's see. That's not the one I had picked. Let's see, maybe it was uh, another book. If I don't find it, then I'll just let you know what it says. I'm going to look at the book of Mark, chapter 1. It's not there either. Uh, I've written down the wrong scripture. But what it says is that Herod was so angry and so jealous of the Christ child and the, inf the, 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 uh, uh, the knowledge of him. It's 2.16? Thank you. Thank you. I'd like to read that. Matthew 2.16? Okay. He was so angry that this is what he decided to do. Verse 16, chapter 2 of the book of Matthew. Then Herod, when he saw that he was mocked of the wise men, was exceeding wroth and sent forth. You know, he, he wanted to find out from them, where was the Christ child? And if he had found out, he would have made every effort to have him killed. Every effort. The reason I know that is because when they mocked him and wouldn't tell him, he went out and told, uh, gave a, a commandment to his people under him to go out and kill every child up to a certain age. Now, you can say what you want to, but I know that in my heart of hearts that there's something at work there that's not normal. And in the normal mind, we will get angry, we will get jealous, we will get envious. We will do all those things that human nature causes us to do. I say cause, I use that loosely because, you know, uh, as, as in the book of James, uh, he tells us that um, God cannot, will not tempt any man. God cannot be tempted, but we're tempted of our own desires. We still have them. We still have the struggle that Paul talks about in, ch in chapter 7 of the book of Romans. But he was so angry, he sent forth and slew all the children that were in Bethlehem and in all the coasts thereof, from two years old and under, according to the time which he had diligently, diligently inquired. This was cold. This was calculated. This was thought out. This was not some just quick fit of anger over um, finding your mate with another person or, or just, uh, just a fit of anger, but, but this was cold calculated. Now you think about that as compared to what we saw the other day. This was a much greater atrocity. But then when I see the pictures and that woman on the cell phone and her mouth, she was, oh, she was, she was just uh, so grieving. It just, you know, hits you right in your heart and you just can't keep from getting emotional and you shouldn't. Let's go to Ephesians, the sixth chapter. I bet you thought, well, he's going to turn there one. <clears throat> and you're right. Because there's another spirit at work in people who would like to do evil. Ephesians, the sixth chapter. I'll just read verse 12. Verse 11 talks about us putting on our armor so this will not affect us. He's warning us to put on that armor. In verse 12 he says, For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness. And these were all, this is all talking about the Pharisees, the scribes, Herod. I'll leave Pilate out because he didn't want to have anything to do with Christ's death. I'll give him that much. It was not his, not his idea. But he gave over to the people, did he not? Yeah, I washed my hands of it. You, you go do what you're going to do. But all of those things they actually talk about the time of Christ before he died. 
and when he died. Cold and calculated planning to kill the Messiah. Wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, powers, against the rulers of darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness, wickedness in high places. And those spiritual wicked in high places come into the mind of a person of low places. They have friends in low places. No pun intended. So we see there's a battle going on uh, with people that are like that. Let's go to Luke, the 22nd chapter. Matthew, Mark, Luke, let's see. <clears throat> Pick up uh, maybe a verse there, Luke 22. <clears throat> In verse 3, <clears throat> this is talking about the night of the Passover, the night of Christ's passion or the night of his death. This was taking place at the table where he broke bread with his 12 disciples. You know, uh, the, the, the table and the breaking of bread together with your brethren is supposed to enhance your affection, your love, your compassion. But here we find in verse 3 where <clears throat> Satan entered into this uh, Verse 3, then entered Satan into Jesus, excuse me, Judas, pardon me, uh, Judas, surnamed Iscariot, being of the number of the twelve. One of the twelve that Christ chose turned against him at the table. Luke 22, verse 31. Talking about Peter, Christ says, and the Lord said, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan has desired to have you that he may sift you as wheat. Now that's, a, that's one of the apostles. And Christ, he was perceptive enough to know what was happening with Satan and he was going to work on, with Peter. And if Peter didn't have any self-control and if Christ basically didn't pray for him, he was the next one that Satan had in mind. You read it right there. John 13. <clears throat> Verse 21. When Jesus had thus said, he was troubled in spirit and testified and said, Truly, truly, I say unto you that one of you shall betray me. This was planned out, people. Verse 26 says, Jesus answered when they said, Who is it, Lord? He said, He it is to whom I shall give a sop when I have dipped it. And when he had dipped the sop, he gave it to Judas Iscariot. And it's like, He just told him, I'm going to give it to the man who's going to betray me. And they could not believe it. You know, one of the things you hear when people go and interview uh, maybe a neighbor of this boy or anybody else, I, I can't believe it. I can't believe it. I just can't believe he, he or she would do anything like that. They were always quiet and neighborly and friendly. Or the other thing you hear is this. Well, this person had begun to withdraw, <coughs> withdraw from social contact became moody, irritable, unable to be received by you. Those are two of the basic things that you hear. I can't believe it. Well, we believe it every time we see it, and we hate it as much as we can. That's the anger that we should have. He gave it to Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon. And after the sop, he entered into him again. Satan going to and fro in the earth. Peter tells us, seeking whom he may devour. 
And Peter was speaking to the church. Seeking whom he may devour. It's possible. It really is. Then you could look at the parables of the seed that is set in soil. It grows a little bit. And said, Satan can come and take the seed away. And God allows that because he gives us the instrument of truth, the instrument of peace, the instrument of joy, even in the face of death, we can have a joy knowing what our future is going to be. Psalms 23. Now, I don't know of anybody in the scriptures that had more troubles than David. And I have to say that he brought on most of them. But then there were times when it was just the fact that he was close to, to God, uh, that there was something working that was not physical. Again, with his enemies. Working with his enemies against David. David understood about salvation. David understood about the resurrection. David understood that as long as he was in God's hands, he should not fear what was going to take place with him in the latter day. When Christ comes back, he knows he's going to be in God's kingdom. David says, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. But people can interrupt that. And that's why I lock my doors at night in the country. I'm not fearful of my neighbors. But there's more people in and out of that community that are not my neighbors. Okay? Okay? Back in the day, nobody locked their doors. Back in the day, in the 50s and 60s, we'd travel from California to, to Arkansas and back, and we'd just pull over to the side of the road and make a pallet on the ground and go to sleep. I wouldn't be caught dead <laughs> doing that now. But we did. We just made a pallet, either on a picnic table or on, on the, the seat, or just on the ground. We didn't have a lot of money for motels and hotels and things like that. So we made do. But I, let me tell you, those days are over. Any innocence that we had in this country is gone. I look on the back, back years when I was growing up, I look on that and I think it's, well, it was so innocent back then. In my mind, I think about the innocence that was there. And the naivete maybe, but it was certainly a more innocent time. He says, uh, he makes me die down in green pastures. He leaves me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. You know, I, I've, in, in the past few weeks, I've, been, um, uh, I've been, been, been in need of some inspiration. You know, you go through your walk with Christ, and there's going to be times when your inspiration or your um, relationship is not what you would like it to be. And maybe you can't put a finger on it, but you know that you're not where you should be, okay? You're not where you should be with your Creator. And I don't know how, about you folks, but sometimes I let it go to the point where I, I, I've got to pray about it. I've got to confess whatever it is I think is wrong. And, and, and the wrong is me, not, not my God. The wrong is in me. And one of the things that helps me to... to Receive inspiration is just to look at God's creation. Or think of you. And my inspiration begins to be restored in my soul. That's what David's talking about that. He restores my soul. Verse 4. Yeah, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For thou art with me, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. And other things that he says in that particular chapter. Let's go to 2 Timothy.
Paul speaking to his beloved son in the faith. Second Timothy in the first chapter. Paul speaking to his beloved Timothy, he says, in verse 2, To Timothy, my, deli- uh, my dearly beloved son, grace, mercy, peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus Lord. Yeah, we could be walking through the valley of death. We could be at our Red Sea. We could be at a crossroads in our life. We could even know that I am about to die. But that would not leave us without hope. Because Christ was resurrected, so shall we be. I better move along. <clears throat> we have hope. And Paul is talking to his beloved Timothy. He says, verse 3, I, I thank God whom I have served from my, uh, whom I served from my forefathers with pure conscience and without ceasing I have remembrance of thee in my prayers night and day. You know, we pray for each other. It's good, because we all need it. Greatly desiring to see thee, being mindful of your tears, that I may be filled with joy. Timothy was crying. He was upset about something. He he was probably longing for his father in the faith. I call to remembrance the unfaith faith that is in thee, which uh, dwelt first in your grandmother, Lois, and your mother, Eunice, And I am persuaded that in you also. A child with a mother and father in the faith is one that's going to be heads above somebody that's not. He so I put I said I put you in remembrance that that uh, thou stir up the gift of God which is in thee by the putting on of my hands. He 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 anointed Timothy to be what he was. He saw in Timothy something that he knew would be to God's glory. An asset, a tool in God's hands. That's all servants are. Verse 7, For God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power, of love, and a sound mind. And a 9 millimeter, which I have in my, my truck, because bad things can happen to, quote, unquote, good people. You know how I mean that. I'm, not that I'm that good. Paul says in 2 Timothy 4, chapter, he says, I have fought a good fight. That's all God requires of us. He requires us to fight the fight, to make the effort, to exercise self-control when your mind tells you and your desires say, I, I, I know Self-control, temperance. Paul said he fought a good fight. I'm going to close now with Isaiah, the 65th chapter. Isaiah 65 talks about the glorious time of Christ's second coming. And he talks about two category of people here. One who does not forsake God, as it says in verse 11, does not forsake his holy mountain, Verse 12, he says, that group he'll number with, uh, with a sword. He said, verse 13, that group, therefore, they... Uh, Behold, my servants shall eat, but you shall be hungry. Behold, my servants shall drink, but you shall be thirsty. Behold, my servants shall rejoice, but you shall be ashamed. Behold, my servants shall sing for joy of heart, but you shall cry for sorrow of heart and shall howl for vexation of spirit. And you shall leave your name for a curse unto my chosen. For the Lord God shall slay thee and call his servants by another name. Verse 17. The hope. Behold, I create a new heavens and a new earth, and the former shall not be remembered, nor come to mind. You know, <clears throat> that's going to be great, because I have this, I have this image vexed. It's, it's, what do I call it? <laughs> it is uh, in my mind, 
etched in my mind of that lady talking on the phone with that horrific grief that she was. I have it etched in my mind. But he says here, it will be there no more. Verse 18, but you be glad, uh, but ye, ye, be ye glad and rejoice forever in that which I create. For behold, I create Jer- Jerusalem a rejoicing and her people a joy. And I will rejoice in Jerusalem. Christ is coming back to Jerusalem. He set his feet down on the Mount of Olives. His saints shall be with him. The mount shall cleave to the east and the west. Rivers of living water will be there. Lord, come quicker. I will rejoice in Jerusalem and joy in my people. And the voice of weeping shall be no more heard in her, nor the voice of crying. You know, what, the lady I was talking to yesterday about the uh, gun that I purchased, she had been watching on the television a memorial service for all of the victims. <clears throat> she says she just had to turn her head away, and she couldn't watch all of it, and she, and she shouldn't. She said every time they flashed an image of a different child, it was the same reaction. One of grief. And the grief is for the family that's left. I look forward to the day that God comes back and creates a new heaven and a new earth. I look forward to the resurrection. I look forward to Christ coming back. I look forward to remaining faithful. And I'll help you guys do that if you'll help me. Because I'm telling you, in the life and world that we live in, we need each other's prayers and help. Lord, come quickly.